I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where if you would have told me the worst story I've ever heard in my life, I would say, you know what? I will pass along the information, but I'm not going to tell it the way you told it. Yeah. If you would have told me the most boring thing I've ever heard, I would tell someone else that story, but I would tell it better. So we're going to read a book that you don't have to read and we'll tell it to you with a little, a little faster, a little more flair. I have to say, John Stamos, I've now read 320 pages of your life. Why did you write this? Talk about a man with no story. You know how sometimes I yell at you guys for making me read something? This was like a hit that I cannot believe I had to take. Here's the gist. You want to hear John Stamos' life in 60 seconds? He's handsome. He always wanted to be famous. He fucked a bunch of girls and he's going to tell you about it. So before we get into Jonathan Stamos. That's not true. His name isn't Jonathan. Really? No, you just made that up. It's literally like birth certificate. It says just John. That's like a very common name. I say it was one of the most common names in the world. I thought every John was a Jonathan. John is a full name. You know what a nickname for John is? Jack. <laughs> I learned that because I've heard of the Kennedy. The Beanstalk. <laughs> <laughs> that Kennedy who died. Jack Kennedy? Yeah. John. <laughs> I don't think that that's what we called him. Someone did once. And I said, why? And they said, that's a nickname for John. And I said, what? (laughs) I'm trying to keep us on track. And you're the one going off the rails. I'm trying to ask you, Claire, if you were writing a memoir about your life, what would you have titled last week's chapter? Humiliation Nation. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. So you know I'm like taking little baby steps into being a wife. Totally. And I did something that I'm not proud of. Something humiliating? Yeah. So I had a double date. Okay. Which in itself I find embarrassing. Yeah, that is embarrassing. But I have a friend who happens to be dating somebody and I'm looking for a way, like time is money. And so I said, how could we all hang out at once? Sure. And so she came over yesterday and I set up a couple of really beautiful platters to snack on. I did like a hummus platter with a labna and pita bread and vegetables. I did a cheese platter with cheese and crackers and sliced pepperonis. Wow. And then I did even a, a nacho plate of like chips and guac and dips and salsas and queso. And do you know what the event was that we all got together for? Watching TV. We watched the finals of Dota. Cool. I only know what that is because of you. I only know what that is because of Mac. It is like an international gaming competition. So we watched all these people like play a video game against each other for like hours you loved it? No, I hated it, but I did it because I'm dutiful. <laughs> and that's the humiliation. Yeah, that I like put out a spread so the boys could watch their video games. <laughs> I didn't hate it. I love it. It was sweet. I am not turned on to double dates. There's nothing that I can say to you that I can say in front of your boyfriend. I'm sorry. That's just the way I gab. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to have a conversation that I could have at the bus. I'm here to have like a one-on-one intensely personal and fucked up conversation that like I don't want any other loved one to know about. I will also say I watched a brief moment of this video game with you the other day. It's hard to follow for me. It's I do not know what's going on. At one point, Sophia goes, oh, so the lobster character. And then they're like, that's not a lobster. That's a blah, blah, blah. And then I went and I said, I don't even know which one's the lobster because there's two people who look just like lobsters to me. At one point, I asked Mac how you could tell who's on what team, and he like did a really good job explaining it to me, so I was too embarrassed to say that I still, like, <laughs> really, it just went so far over my head. I couldn't even believe it. Watching it for 15 minutes, I could not tell you how many teams are playing at once. <laughs> because to me, it felt like eight, but I think it was two. The worst part is in between the games, they would have the commentators interview people from the stands, and I have to say people stands. that Stands! Have- <laughs> They were in an arena. What? (laughs) The people who go physically to watch these things, let me tell you, they're not good on a moment's notice. And I don't hate them. Mac actually wanted to go. You know, you're only as sick as your secrets. So I needed to let you guys know what I did this weekend. Watch Dota. I looked at my phone, but I I made it nice. And Ashley, if you were a celebrity and last week was a chapter, what would you title your memoir? I'd say scrap that chapter. This morning was the whole week. I woke up to a text from my brother saying, I'm about to have a baby. And then by the time I was dropping bug in for a walk, the baby was arrived. And I said, oh, my God, there's a baby. I have a niece. That's a pretty big week for me. My family's a whole different shape than it was before. There's like an extra arm on the little tree. Oh, do you love her already? 
Yeah, she's really squishy. I don't really think she does anything. You haven't yet. touched her. You don't know. No, I know, but like you can look at a face and be like, oh, it's squishy. Looks can be deceiving. Yeah, but it's just crazy. That's a pretty crazy sitch for one day. That's so fun. What's the first thing you're going to buy her? I've already bought her a lot of clothes. I know, but now that you know her personality. Now that I know her personality, I think I was right when I went in a more purple direction with some items. And so I think I'll, I'll veer more in that direction. Of all the little towels that have a little animal head on them, what animal do you think she is? Oh, I actually think she's like light blue towel with an elephant head. Oh, that's such a good one. I know. <laughs> it's really cute. Or or white duck towel. <gasps> Not yellow duck. A goose. A goose. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, she's got a goose. I will let you know once I've talked to her over Thanksgiving, once I've had a chance to sit down with her. Yeah, you have to ask her what her favorite color is. Yeah, we don't even know yet. That's the most important question anyone could be asked in their whole life because you will get asked it for your whole life. <laughs> the first six years of your life are mostly, what's your favorite color? How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to be for Halloween? I know we have to get up to the episode and I'm really sorry. But actually, when you hear the episode, you'll be like, I wish they were talking more about baby towels. Can I tell you what Halloween costume I got her? Uh -huh. I got her a little baby Halloween costume just in case she was born for Halloween. And it's just a little skeleton outfit so she could be Phoebe Bridger's baby. That's so funny. I know. What'd you get, Bug? Okay, so she has three costumes, but they're all one costume. One of them is a bat, one of them is a frog, and one of them is like a wizard costume. But the costume, she'll wear them all at different points in the day, is an eccentric billionaire who became a household name after they went streaking at the Met Gala. I don't get it. It's like what an eccentric billionaire who like would have gone streaking at the Met Gala might wear. For Halloween or just every day? Every day. Can you name one? No, it's just Bug. Bug is <laughs> manifesting the kind of outfits she would wear if she was a billionaire? Yeah. And should she become a billionaire, she'd go streaking at the Met Gala? Yeah. That is the last outfit to be done, huh? <laughs> I'm really delighted by everybody's Halloween costumes this year. I think everybody was just so smart about it. I think everybody did such a great job. And when people commit to a costume, it brings me a joy that I can't even explain. I think people are so smart and clever and crafty. And I really love watching people be like so fun and interesting. And I love a pun. I love a commitment. I love like a random reference. I love all of it. I'm so proud of you guys. I hate dressing up. I don't even plan on going outside for Halloween, but I love to see everybody else get into it. I love a pun. I think that that's a really fun time for all. Okay, should we get into this book? If anyone has the time, I'd love to have a chat about John Stamos's book. Why is the forward by Jamie Lee Curtis? Okay, here's the thing. Do you have any insight? No, and I want to talk about it. The forward is by Jamie Lee Curtis, and she basically is like, John is a good guy. She says, John is a good man, and we're lucky that this good man is a human and therefore filled with love and mercy, pun intended, music and adventures, as well as the contradictions, conflicts and stumbles that we can all relate to. And this was a red flag where I say, uh oh, what bad man things has he done? Because I don't feel like you have to come out and be like, he is a good man. He is a good man, Savannah, about anyone who like is actually good. <laughs> I love him and I respect him and I need him. We all do. I don't need him. Jamie Lee Curtis. And this raised a lot of red flags. I think throughout most of this book, I was sitting there trying to figure out what is bothering me about John Stamos. And I think it's that he's not necessarily a bad man. He is like a man devoid of character. You know what I would say about him? What? He is the exact stereotype of what people accuse like female influencers of being. Yes. He's nothing but a fame whore with he like no... Vapid. He is vapid. He's vapid. He's uninteresting. He has no respect or interest or passion for a craft. Truly, he was propelled by the desire to be famous from a young age. And he always says that I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be famous. He goes to acting class one time and then he gets cast in General Hospital, General Hospital, which propels him to this huge career. And then the whole book is about telling you all these people he had sex with. What he wanted was to have sex with lots of women and impress people with it. And that's what he did. And do you know what? I actually didn't need to read a book about it. You know, there's just not much to him. I think that like part of it is that we are in a society where like men are allowed to exist like this. They're given accolades for like simply existing and being handsome and like sometimes joking about it. When a man is handsome and can joke, everyone is like, oh my God, we should all just like lay ourselves at their feet. And it's fucking nasty. And one thing that I realized is that when we get in trouble for overly criticizing someone, it's because we hold people to a certain standard. 
And just because they haven't met that standard doesn't mean I hate them, but I don't think it means that we can't like discuss that. We always talk about having grace. Like, I think that if someone doesn't meet the bar that we hope for, I mean, he is just like a privileged person with lots of opportunity to have learned and like contributed to the world. He just hasn't done those things. And I don't think it's wrong to criticize him for like saying a bunch of really fucked up shit or a bunch of just like absolutely worthless shit, even if it's not even specifically fucked up. And if he in 10 years writes another book and it turns out he's like gone to an actual therapist and like learned and grown, I will have a completely different opinion of him. I don't know that there's anything like to go from here. I just don't think everyone needs to tell their story. Yeah. I just think if he hadn't written a book, I wouldn't have thought twice about him. But the fact that he was like, no, it's not just that I got to fuck every hot woman in the world. It's that I need you to know that I got to fuck every hot woman in the world. And Frank Sinatra thinks I'm cool. I know. I mean, I'm just saying this in response to the people who will inevitably be like, why were you so hard on him? He's just trying to have a good time. And it's like, who fucking cares? Not everyone gets to have a good time and then have every single person in the world say, I actually love that about you. Agreed. He writes also a note from the author, which is pointless. And a preface. And a prologue. He has a note from Jamie Lee Curtis, a note from the author, and a prologue to ramp you up to learn about nothing. This is a story about Hollywood, fame, fortune, and fuck ups. This is a story about home, heart, healing, and hummingbirds. I mean, it's almost about none of those things. Except fame and fortune. So then he starts the book with a really bad DUI. The way he like describes himself I like don't know if he understands specifically how self-centered he is. It's shocking. I've got my dad's rough and rugged features softened up by some of my mom's natural beauty. Imagine being like, I'm both rough, rugged, and naturally beautiful. That's just me driving drunk through the streets of Beverly Hills. Luckily, he's like, of course, everyone's obsessed with calling out my name and getting an autograph. But this time when they're calling out Uncle Jesse, it's because they want me to pull over because I'm like swerving in circles in the lane. There's driving drunk and then there's doing donuts down the freeway. And those are like different things. So he gets arrested and he goes to rehab. And he sends out a tweet saying, thanks to the BHPD, the Beverly Hills Police Department and everybody at Mount Sinai for helping me get through this. Thanking the cops, narc. Anyway, he's like, so this is a low point. I'm missing my dad. My marriage busted up. It's the loss of my mom. By the way, so he gets a DUI and it's 2015. And he blames this on the end of his marriage. Didn't they break up in like 2006? Six. Okay. We'll get to it later. But literally he goes from like, I was reeling from my divorce and he was like, and that's why I drank so much and got in the car that night. I mean, he makes a nine year jump in that single phrase that night. I don't know. How many years do you get to be reeling from a divorce that you get so fucked up that you're like driving in circles? You and I are notoriously anti-drunk driving. It's one of our few stances. (laughs) Drunk driving, genocide. We like hate those two things mainly, but like other stuff too. Controversially. Yeah. Oh my God. We hate cars in New York City. (laughs) We believe in bike lanes, bitch. So I don't think even if he had like gotten divorced that day, I don't know that I would have been like, oh, okay, totally. Yeah. But just the way that he's really pinning it on Rebecca Romaine for why he got a DUI nine years later feels like a stretch. One of the many pins he stabbed her with. I'm lonely, but never alone. In a sober state, I have the pride, morals, and values to avoid the proverbial low-hanging fruit. But what fun is that? I don't know. I don't even know what he's talking about here. Just about how he he was never a big partier, but then every time he steps over the line, it gets fainter each time. And I don't know how this happened. See, it's not that bad. People don't get hurt. And then he goes, every lost man should be lucky enough to have the grace and goodness of a Brazilian housekeeper to hide his bad habits and store away his secrets for a little while. Oh my God. And then he introduces you to his housekeeper, who he refers to as his nanny. Dolce lets me be a good guy, a ghost, a piece of shit, and a friend. Okay. And then we never hear from her again. Just a quick shout out. It's not even like a fucked up way of saying thank you to her. It's like actually a piece of advice if he's like, hey, listen, if you're rich and looking to just fuck around for most of your life, hire someone to be your mom. A Brazilian housekeeper. He then talks about how he's so lonely, but he can't give up his Playboy image. I can't go on my friend Howard Stern's show without him salivating over girls he thinks I've slept with. Or Jimmy Kimmel, another pal who never misses the opportunity to paint me as the ultimate Playboy. And who could blame them? I play into it 100%. It's flattering. I feel it's my solemn duty to uphold my status as that guy, keeping the dream alive for all those average Joes out there, giving them someone to live vicariously through. Who cares if it's at the expense of my own happiness? It's not easy. It's not easy fucking my way through life and feeling so empty. But what are the boys going to jerk off to? What are my boys going to jerk off to? I do it for the boys. If I'm not out here acting like a playboy, the uggos at home won't think it's cool to treat women like shit. They'll say, if John Stamos is nice to girls, 
Who am I? An uggo in Kansas. How am I going to treat a woman like shit? (laughs) Why did you write this book? Just shut your mouth. Every time he talks, I think he gets himself into trouble. His shrink, Phil Stutz. Do you know Stutz? No. Famously of the documentary Stutz, made by Jonah Hill about his shrink, Phil Stutz. Oh my God, they have the same therapist? This man is a head. (laughs) He is not doing anybody any good. Has he ever fixed anyone? Stop trying to charm the world, my shrink says. You've already done that. Show them you're an actor, that you're the real deal. Phil Stutz, you are a menace to society. So anyway, after this, he immediately is ushered into rehab and he can't believe that his little sisters and all of his friends are all helping him. I can't believe I have so many loving people in my life trying to help. I need to get better for them. In the moment, I don't realize that's not how this works. Healing starts with the self. I think you've been thinking about yourself a lot, buddy. So don't worry about it. Yeah, I think that if you for a second say, hey, what do these other people maybe need from me? This is so all over the place. And then he's like, and thank you to my mentor, Gary Marshall, who's the guy who told me I needed a catchphrase. So what I came up with was have mercy. And then he's like, listen, the message becomes clear. Take it easy on yourself. Have patience. Forgive. Be merciful. Have mercy. Listen, buddy, I don't think that that's what Uncle Jesse meant when he said have mercy every time a hot girl walked by. I don't think he was talking about like God giving his grace. (laughs) Go easy on yourself. So club fame, members only. That's literally chapter two. Since I can remember, I always wanted to be in the club. Club fame. There's something about humble beginnings mixed with the backdrop of Disneyland and youthful indignities that gives you the overwhelming sense of wanting to matter or be brightly lit. So he was raised in Orange County near Disneyland and his dad owned a restaurant. His dad's Greek. His mom's Irish. And that's his humble beginnings. They were like middle class in Orange County. He would always try to save up to go to Disneyland. He's like a Disney freak and that's who he is through and through. I don't know what he's ever talking about in this book. And I think that's why I made it such a quick read because there was just so many things where I went, I've reread it twice. It doesn't make sense. Let it go. Well, it's because he takes every story and he'll like start to talk about something that happened in his life and be like, anyway, this is about how awesome I am. And then it just like devolves into a different story. Yeah. He talks about like all the hot girls at Disneyland and how none of them wanted him because they all wanted guys older. I forget about the crowds and missed opportunities with the Cinderella's and the Snow White's center midst. I've never been in love. I don't know what it feels like. Maybe it's like sliding into a Matterhorn bobsled and holding on for dear life. There's an element of danger at every turn. There are dark caverns, steep hills, and claustrophobic tunnels. There's a foreboding specter of the abominable snowman lurking like God or Satan behind the sheets of ice. And then you plunge into the unknown. Do you hold on in fear or release your grip and accept the moment? That shit is Freudian all day long, and it's all I understood about the future. I lift my hands up and let go. Splash. What does that mean? What does even mean Freudian? You have that therapist. He doesn't even explain what Freud... Like, what was Freudian here? I don't know. Anyway, so he wants to be a drummer. So he starts taking drum classes and he drums in the marching band and he loves drums. The other thing that he's obsessed with is he falls in love with acting when he goes to like a Wild West showdown review at Knott's Berry Farm, which I relate to that. I went to a Wild West review one time in Arizona when I went to visit my grandparents and when they like shoot each other and like fake fall down, it looks like they fall off a building, but they really fall on a crash pad. I was like, oh, that is entertainment. (laughs) I understand wanting to be that guy. Anyway, so then he goes, I want to be famous just like these people. And that's what inspires him to be an actor. I mean, the thing is, his childhood goes by pretty quickly because it was just like a good childhood. I used to do a joke about how I know I had an easy life because I can't remember any of it. (laughs) Because like trauma sticks, but like happy Christmases, they just all like blend in to one another. And that's kind of his book as he's like, I remember, you know, flipping eggs at my dad's restaurant and going to Knott's Berry Farm and we would save up money to go to Disneyland. And then I was 17 and I was like, okay, so easy peasy lemon squeezy. And not that I would wish trauma on anyone. I think it's so great when people have good childhoods. I think we forget that that's the goal in like this Gen Z thing of like bragging about trauma and like the real housewife in New York race to the bottom of vulnerability. Like you're only as vulnerable as you were fucked up. By a parent figure, like this thing where it's like the best thing that you can have to your name is a horrible backstory. I'm happy for him that his life squeaks by easy breezy. And I think even happy people could have a story, but he didn't really. No. And I wish I hadn't had to watch him try to figure one out because he has a handsome man disease, which is the disease that most men have, but handsome men have it worse. They think everything that's ever happened to them is like something other people want to hear about. And I was going to say they think they should get to be funny. Yeah. 
It's like the thing that eludes them, but they convince themselves that they've figured it out, that they've found out how to be self-deprecating just the right way. And he's not funny, but he's been around funny people. And he also will tell a eight page story with no point just because at one point he has like a good punchline in there. Have mercy. Amen. One time he got bullied. Do you guys want to hear about it? He like literally acts like he was bullied his whole life. He was like, back in the days, we didn't have the resources that kids have these days for bullying. Okay. What happened was he found out that this girl might have a crush on him. And then he finds out that everybody has a crush on him. He was in band and he said, she knows who I am. And the guy goes, all the girls know you are. You're John Stamos. What? For as long as I can remember, I've been pretty much invisible to girls. I called myself Big Nose Stamos. This revelation from a kid who sounds like he admires me is a symbol crash that wakes me up. First of all, that kid did not say he admired you. Already he's like, a girl likes me? All girls like me? And that makes you a man like me? Wow, everybody likes me. This is crazy. So he goes around and he tells everybody that he's hearing a rumor. There's a party that night. And he goes to the party and tells everyone at the party that this girl has a crush on him. And then he's sitting in the car talking to a friend. And a guy comes out to the car and knocks on the window and goes... John Stamos, or maybe he says Big Nose Stamos. That was maybe the bullying. So you're telling everyone my girlfriend wants to go out with you, Big Nose? And then he goes, listen, man, she was the one. Actually, we have not met her in this book. She is a ghost of a rumor. Yeah. Of your own ego that you have now spread like wildfire. And anyway, the guy punches him in the face and then they drive off. And then at school that next day, he finds out that the guy's looking for him because he wants to beat his ass again. And he's like, oh, God, the only way to not get beat up by Rick again is to get famous. <laughs> Every time I hit a new milestone in my career, I think of looking him up and taking him down. Who cares? Of course, we are unreliable narrators of our own experience. And what we consider our first drive is often just a punch in the face that is too obvious. Our real motivation rarely comes from revenge. Let that black eye fade and open your eyes to what comes next. Well, then why did you just say your only motivation has ever been getting punched in the face by Rick? He really is like the bullying, the bullying, the bullying. That's not bullying. That's valid. (laughs) Like that guy shouldn't have punched you maybe, but like he wasn't like wrong to be mad at you. Bullying is not just every time somebody doesn't like you. It has to be like systemic. It has to be constant and it has to be like without reason. You walking around spreading rumors about his girlfriend. I was reading that and I was like, at what point is he the victim? (laughs) So once we get past that story, the next big story is he watches them do Grease at a high school nearby and he goes, John Travolta. Now that's charisma. And then at one point he meets Robin Williams. And I don't really understand how that story relates literally at all. Then he talks about how much he respects women. He loves his mom, who's a stay at home mom. And I will say I found it redeeming how much he respects his mom. Yeah, I prefer women to men bosses any day of the week. He goes, I get the message at a young age that women are valuable and do respect. He gets the message, but I don't know that he internalizes it. Yeah, I also would like to cross-reference this when we do the Patreon this week. Because of my upbringing, I learned that no unequivocally means no. I never want to be presumptuous or cross a line, no matter how wildly the hormones rage. Interesting thing to throw in there, good guy Stamos. Anyway, but he's really horny. He makes a school band. One day he's over at his friend's house and they smoke weed for the first time. And then this girl's older sister literally just shows up, throws keys in his lap and is like, let me help you with those keys and then has sex with him. And then he's like, oh, now I've had sex and it kind of hurts. I'm thinking this is what the whole world revolves around. It hurts. Eventually when the pain subsides, I understand. Damn. Okay. I don't know what he had, but I don't know why it was painful for him. And I don't know why it felt good later. Yeah. I'm like worried about him. I'm worried about him too. This is like not a way that I've really ever heard sex described. I mean, I have for women. I am now a member of the I've finally had sex club, but club fame still remains elusive. Okay. You don't get to go to every club at once. (laughs) You have to take them one at a time. So then his mom lets him take acting classes and he shows up. And in the first acting class, he goes, I don't want to be some flash in the pants. And everyone goes, flash in the pants. And then everyone laughs at him and he goes, okay, fine, I get it. I messed up the term. My point is I don't want to be a one-hit wonder, a here today, gone tomorrow kind of guy, a wham, bam, thank you. I get it, Jim says. No, actually, you don't. I mean, I think they do. He's like, nobody in this acting class could understand what it's like to be me, somebody who wants to be successful at acting. (laughs) Built different. And so his mom gets him a small-time agent and becomes like his momager and he does some commercials right out the gate. He's in one with Bill Cosby for Coca-Cola. And he's like, I never would have guessed that Bill Cosby's a uh, bad guy. He becomes friends with somebody on the Young and the Restless who hooks him up with movers and shakers and kooks in the industry. 
He gets invited to a Scientology audit and then they're like, actually, you don't need to come back. And he's like, hmm, can't believe Scientology didn't want me. <laughs> but before he's even really landed at anything other than a commercial, he meets this woman named Doreen Leoy, who is an editor at Tiger Bee and a virginal, pasty, lonely soul who gloms onto my family. She puts him in the magazine constantly as like the heartthrob du jour. And she loves my mom's nurturing ways. She even calls her mom and my family sort of adopts her. She spends her holidays at her house. So even though he hasn't been anything, he's like 17, 18 at this point, and he's already in Tiger Beat magazine being made into like a heartthrob because back in the day, that was one of the only ways that teens could consume like media. So that is a big deal. It is a really big deal. And I cannot wait to tell you more about Doreen. <laughs> and then he's like, I was kept safe by my mom because she had a watchful eye. And then he's like, I was lucky I wasn't like Todd Bridges or Mackenzie Phillips or the two Corys, Heyman Feldman, who were completely exploited and hurt and stuff. And then I'm like, well, yeah, also, you didn't really get into the industry until you were like 17, 18. Yeah. That is fundamentally different than being a child star. I mean, it's a completely different thing. He was only ever famous as an adult. And I get that 18 is still like a young adult. It's a fresh baby. I think that there are like dangerous things that happen to young adults in the industry. I think there are dangerous things that happen to everyone in the industry. But I don't think you're like susceptible in the same way when you can vote. Mm -hmm. So his dad finally is like, all right, you have to go to business school and someday take over the restaurant unless you can make something else happen pretty much immediately. Luckily, he does. One of his very first auditions for General Hospital, he goes in in three days, he lands the role and they're like, you start in two weeks, we'll pay you $400 a week. He spends so much time talking about his audition for this role. It was insane. Is this insane specifically because he doesn't like care about acting? Yeah. I don't want to say he has no talent, but like he has no passion for the craft or skill of acting. Well, whenever he talks about like getting into character, he's always just like, what would John Travolta do? <laughs> so he gets in, I guess Rick Springfield is there who just had to hit Jesse's girl and he's kind of a dick. And he like wants to get out of the show. So his character, Blackie Parrish, is only supposed to be on it for a few episodes. But he's like, I am going to make this character make waves and then they won't be able to kill me off. And, you know, it works. He loves it. He talks about his very first day getting camera and hair and makeup and wardrobe. I don't care. I feel pampered and special. I've never had anyone examine my face in such detail, adding foundation to make it glow, then powder to minimize shine. Every hair on my head is contemplated and considered before it lightly sprayed into an immovable quaff. And I'm like, that's what he loves about it. He loves the pampering and the being special. So he pretty immediately gets a nose job. Like as soon as he makes a little bit of money from the show, because he's still living at home and working at his dad's restaurant on Sundays. So he's, you know, saving up a good chunk of money. So he goes to get a nose job and then he doesn't really like it. So he gets a second nose job. And that's kind of that. Yeah. After about a year, he says to his dad, I can't keep working on Sundays. I'm like famous. <laughs> and just like that, I go from serving up discount breakfast on Sundays to spending every day of the week on daytime TV, serving up my heart on a platter. This is like a theme in the book where he'll just start talking about something and the story is about nothing other than how famous he is. So he talks about being on General Hospital with Demi Moore. And then he's like, years later, I ran into her at a party and someone was like, oh my God, Blackie and Jackie. Did you two ever fuck? We both look at each other, wondering what the other will say. Demi pauses to think about it. I don't know if we slept together. I think we fooled around, though. I just smiled, and I asked if she remembers back in the day when we all went to see Rick Springfield at the Universal Amphitheater. So I was like, oh, my God, they banged after the Rick Springfield concert at the Universal Amphitheater. But it's actually just a story about how they went as a cast to go see Rick Springfield. And then he was so famous that all of the girls in the audience started, like, chasing him around the amphitheater. And I was like, why did you ask Demi more if she remembers that? She probably doesn't. Also, I feel like he's insinuating that they did have sex, which is crazy because if in private Demi Moore is denying that you guys had sex, I can't believe you put it in a book. She's like, amongst friends, Demi would never admit that we boned. So that's why publicly I would like to announce for the record that I'm the hottest guy at the Universal Amphitheater. <laughs> who probably also fucked Demi Moore. Yeah. As my popularity rises, I'm given more screen time, which is definitely driving up my fan mail. And with that comes a flurry of personal appearances, press events, and talk show. Then he talks about how sick it is to be flown around everywhere. How he almost banged Heather Locklear, but he got too drunk and fell asleep. So I guess back in the day, the way it would work is you do like autograph signings at events and they pay you to come. And then people have to buy your photo at the event. He would do car shows and stuff. And he goes, Sometimes they'll send along 12 Playboy Playmates with me, and other times it might just be the hot ingenue du jour, and one of those hot ingenue is their luckier. She tried to fuck him, but as Ashley said, he passed out. Okay, and then we get to the craziest story I think I've ever read in a memoir. Doreen, the Tiger Beat editor who, like, helped put him on, she was, like, getting a bit frustrated with him because he wanted to do other magazines, too. 
she was like close with the whole family and really good friends, especially with the mom. In the OC at the same time, there was a serial killer named Richard Ramirez who was just running around murdering like crazy. He gets captured and they show him on TV and Doreen is like, that's a hot guy. He has it. She says to his mother, he has that little boy quality that Johnny has. Don't you think there's something captivating about him? So then she starts writing Richard Ramirez letter after letter. I looked it up online. She wrote him 75 letters before he like responded to her. And then they started dating while he was in prison. And she was like, we're going to get married. And this is the funniest response of all is John Stamos's mother, Loretta, goes, Doreen, there's so many women out there who also think they're going to marry him. You're not special. <laughs> Imagine telling this woman, who's uh, this adult woman who's obsessed with your teenage son that like she's not even hot enough to marry a, an imprisoned mass murderer. And then Doreen goes, I have something the other women don't have. I still have my virginity. I'm a virgin and Richard knows it. That's why I'm different. I can't believe Loretta is like reasoning with her about trying to like marry an imprisoned serial killer instead of being like, Doreen, he murders people. (laughs) Well, so then John Stamos's dad, Bill, is like, Loretta, we have to cut Doreen out of our lives. She's a crazy person. And Loretta is like, okay, but keeps talking to her on the phone. And then the dad catches them talking on the phone and is like, no, literally stop. And so she's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. (laughs) And then he just moves on. I'm sorry, what? (laughs) I think she did marry him. Good for her. At least somebody reached their dreams. And then they got divorced because she found out that some of the allegations were proven true, (laughs) that he was like a sociopath. We got to draw a line somewhere. Ladies, it's hard up there. You got to have our deal breakers. (laughs) Oh, my God. Doreen, you nut. So here's what he has to say right after that. Being a teen idol suits me just fine. Look beyond the corniness of the images and writing. and You'll see a kid on fire. It's a hell of a ride and I'm up for all of it. Okay, this is him letting you know, in case you were worried that being super famous for being hot wasn't fun, it was fun. He goes, sometimes it's so busy that it feels like I can't even enjoy it. But then other moments, I'm so present and almost exploding with the realization that I'm famous. Girls are interested in me. And somewhere out there, that bully bastard Rick Clark sees the eyes of his girlfriend glide over my mug, sneering at him from some magazine cover. Okay, I feel like you're the bully now. Yeah. So then he talks about this one part, another problem with fame. He talks about how sometimes girls will just like come and have sex with him. And he's like, it's actually like not that sexy because afterwards they have to like clean themselves up and you realize they're like a person. Yeah, he's talking about just waiting in his green room or whatever backstage. And this model who's auditioning for roles walks by and turns out she's a penthouse pet. And then they just have sex. And then he's like, I don't know, but later the lights are back on. He goes, you don't account for the swift gathering of garments and the splashing sounds of the sink. Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. The penthouse pet seeks to star in legit shows with old casting couch methods likely learned from pervy execs. The new kid in town she seduces is still too young to toss a shot of sake across the street. But meanwhile, he doesn't have enough power to help her. Dear penthouse forum, you'll never guess what just happened. I arrived early for work the next day and head into Kin's dressing room. Before I can kiss and tell, he trumps me with the breaking news. Hey, congrats on your Emmy nomination. So don't worry, if you think having random sex with penthouse pets is fun, it's not even nearly as fun as the fact that he's being nominated for Emmys. A daytime Emmy, to clarify, that he loses. Okay, so then he notices that there aren't like good roles for black people on daytime television. He doesn't do anything about it, but he does notice. But he does say like, hey, I'm aware. He knew. (laughs) Okay. And then he gets to work with Sammy Davis Jr. And he's like, that was so crazy because I really wanted to play drums on the show. So I asked Sammy Davis Jr. if he could help me. And now I'll always remember Sammy Davis Jr. as the person who helped me play drums on General Hospital. And it's just like, for once, could you possibly try to tell a story? Even though it would be annoying, even though I like don't like when people spend the entire book just shouting out other people, I like didn't realize I had to set the bar so low as to be like, But also, when you are just going to name drop, at least let them be a person. Like, at least let them have any sort of accolades outside of they made John Stamos drums. I mean, and he says it to him, too. After Sammy Javis Jr. gets diagnosed with cancer and is sick and is kind of on his deathbed, they see each other one last time. And he goes, thank you for what you did for me. They never would have let me play music on General Hospital if it wasn't for you. Now I have my own band on the show called Blackie and the Riff Raff. And there's a whole storyline to go along with it. Like, at least just lie and say you were an inspiration to me. He's a fucking legend. And you're like, oh, God, you will go down in history as the man who helped John Stamos get his band on General Hospital, his fake band. 
So then he's like given a real storyline where his mom dies and he has to show emotion and he's trying to get into character. And for the first time on set, I really lose it and yell out, will someone get that old woman out of my eyeline? Because he's trying to cry and he's having a hard time and a woman distracts him. And it turns out that old woman is Elizabeth Taylor. I think he's like a not good person. He like yells at people a lot. Anyway, so after a year or two on General Hospital, it's clear that he's the breakout star and he wants to leave. He gets a real agent at WME and they know that he's trying to leave. So they just keep throwing all the money in the world at him. And he goes to his dad. And he goes, I don't know what to do because on the one hand, if I leave, I can do whatever I want. But on one hand, if I stay, they'll pay me so much money, but I'd have to be there all the time. And his dad's like, if you have to be somewhere, it's not worth it. Follow your dreams. So he leaves General Hospital. He wants to be on a sitcom. He wants to be funny. That's his number one goal. Also, at this time, he gets word from his agent that this actress named Terry Copley thinks he's hot. And he's like, do you know what? I actually could settle down right now. Like, they don't know each other. He just knows that this girl is looking for a serious relationship. And he's like, yeah, good idea. I'll be in one. So they start dating and he's trying out a bunch of new roles. He is like the hot young thing in town, but nothing he does really works. He talks about a show that he stars in called... It's like something that's trying to be an imitation of the monkeys. Yeah, where it's like him and his band where he's the only quote unquote real musician. He says, John Peters, Barbara Streisand's hairdresser turned boyfriend turned de facto manager is executive producing. There's a lot of that kind of thing happening around me. Folks who subvert the old nose to the grindstone ladder of leadership and slip into success with sex. Okay, John Stamos, I wouldn't exactly say you paid dues. You like showed up one time to an audition and just became famously hot. So I don't know that you should be like knocking people whose sexiness gets them to the top. Anyway, so he starts dating Terry Copley and he's like, she's everything I was looking for in a woman. But there's nothing romantic about the description. There's no heart in the way he's talking about her. But then he like goes on a trip and she's like not really answering him when she comes back and he's being ghosted. So he goes to her house and like finds her in bed with Tony Danza. And he's like, my heart was shattered. He also claims that his sexual experiences were limited to a few girls. Where Annie's teaching moments end, Terry steps in and seamlessly introduces me to new and unexplored territories. We role play with her taking on the persona of Marilyn Monroe while I assume the role of Bobby Kennedy or JFK, your friend Jack, Jack. or Frank Sinatra or Joe DiMaggio or Arthur Miller with the glasses when I'm feeling particularly daring. I don't know. I feel like it's so gross to like share intimate sex details of a woman you had sex with like 40 years ago. Especially to be like, and she cheated on me, and she was the one who wanted a serious relationship in the first place. Like, I don't know, man. I feel like to like mope around about how heartbroken you are. I am so sick of guys in their memoirs being like, you don't understand. When I was 20 years old, a girl was really mean to me. And that's why I've been such a dick for the last 30 years. You have to just get over it. So then he's in some movie that he thinks is going to blow him up called Never Too Young to Die. It's a Bond movie, which I do think that that wasn't actually crazy of him to think it would be a big thing for his career, but it actually sucks. Oh, the way he talked about it, I thought it was like an imitation Bond movie. No, I think it was just the worst Bond movie ever made. (laughs) Gene Simmons is in it. And then Vanity, who is Prince's protege. And you guys know that I think this might be one of our hottest takes. We think Prince might be a bad person. Yeah. We've seen a lot of women come out from under his spell, like fucked up irrevocably. That woman, Mate or Matey. Yeah. Who he like adopted in order to date her on the road because she was underage. And then this Sinead O'Connor story where he chased her around, threatening to hurt her physically. There's a lot of sus. And then everybody who has a good Prince story is like, he invited me to a party. Wasn't that nice? I don't know. I, one of our hot takes is that we don't think Prince is nice. So he has a protege that eventually like died from like ruining her body with drugs, I think. I actually don't know if that's exactly it, but I know that she's the one who like taught Nikki Six how to like more effectively shoot cocaine into his body. I want to say I don't say that to say that she's a bad person. I mean to say that as she is a person who it seems like has had a lot of demons and so to expose her like this in this book is not nice. Mere moments after meeting Vanity for the first time, she's giving me a hand job under the table. Not even sure how it starts. I'm making small talk as she rearranges a napkin in my lap and the next thing I know she's all in. It's exciting, but nerve wracking. And like they're talking to their producers. If they're at a restaurant meeting the whole cast for the first time at a dinner. And then he talks about how crazy it is. And later he goes, looking back, I feel for her. Her dad abused her until he died. Then she was modeling at 17 and molded into the sex pot image by influential men who wanted to make her their nasty gal. Ugh. She ping ponged from freebasing cocaine to tripping on the stronger drug of evangelical religion. I imagine a lot was done to her and somehow doing a little something to a younger inexperienced guy and waving machine guns around gave her a feeling of reclaiming power. Okay, I just have to say, 
There was literally no reason to share this story unless you wanted to be like things that happened to me that made me feel uncomfortable. Oftentimes I feel like women were using me like older women. Like there is a string of stories in this book of women who are older than him kind of like being very sexually aggressive. And I think it'd be fair to be like, these things were happening to me and I thought that they were supposed to be cool, but I look back and often I felt out of control. But instead he's like sharing them like, actually it was kind of cool, but she might've had problems. I just think to like sum up this woman that you probably weren't even thinking about before I told you about her as being kind of like a crazy skank. She had a fucked up life. Like why say this at all? None of this had to be said. It's just name dropping. And it's so funny because then later he rails against Rebecca Romaine for having like name droppy friends. This whole book is just name droppy about who we hooked up with. Yeah. And then he meets the Beach Boys. And he really believes he invented the Beach Boys. It comes up so much throughout this book. I think he thinks he's like a core member of the Beach Boys. And it's like a huge part of his identity. And I don't know how to tell him that I think he like isn't. Basically, he meets them because one time he's at an event and he's being so chased by girls because he's chased everywhere he goes that he has to run backstage and hide. And they're like, who are you? And they're like, get this man on stage. And so he starts singing Barbara Ann with them. Little do I know that this one night stand will be a lifelong love affair. Right now, it's just a great feeling that I'm ready to recreate at work in life and in love. I've fallen down the rabbit hole and I don't want to return to the ordinary world ever again. So then he plays with them at some July 4th thing for Nancy Reagan, a close personal friend of his. Yeah. And then he like definitely makes it a point to be like, it actually doesn't matter who you vote for. We should all just listen to the Beach Boys. Totally. I don't know. It's all these stories about times he was with famous people. There is this sense within him that like he's always like, wow, these people that I look up to know my name. And then by the end of the story, you're like, oh, do you think they think you're famous? Like, do you think Frank Sinatra thinks you're Frank Sinatra? Like he has this idea that because famous people that he idolizes know his name back, that he's like elevated to their level. And I'm like, you're not Frank Sinatra. You're not fucking Elvis. You're not a beach boy. Yeah. God, he like manages to throw Julia Roberts in here. Because I think every man that's ever met Julia Roberts, it's like really important that you know they met Julia Roberts. Basically, he has that mentor, Gary, who's the one that's like, you need a catchphrase. Gary Marshall. Apparently, he was always like, you need to meet Julia Roberts. You need to meet Julia Roberts. And they never get around to meeting. And then on Gary's deathbed, they're both at the hospital at the same time. Hi, John. I'm Julia. Gary always wanted us to meet. And here we are. She gives me a friendly hug. And although he is in a coma, I swear I see a smile on Gary's face. Okay. He was saying that for like fun. Gary Marshall's dying wish could not have been that John Stamos and Julia Roberts hug each other once. Like, what an insane thing to project. (laughs) The way that every story is not just about him telling you about a hot girl he was near, but about how much all of his friends love that he's near hot girls. He genuinely thinks his purpose on this life is to fuck all the hot women. And then, like, make sure that other men are able to, like, find power in that. (laughs) He's breaking the hymen ceiling. (laughs) Anyway, so now we get to Full House. He is told that this TV show, this sitcom, is going to be like a three guys show with some kids in the background. I don't know how he like never read the script before he signed on for the show, but he talks about how this whole show was coming together. There was incredible casting. They were so excited. And as soon as he gets to the first table read, he's like, oh, my God, the kids are the funny part of this show. We're just guys. He is so threatened by Jody Sweeten, <laughs> former celebrity book club memoirist. Uh, go back and listen to her book if you want to hear it. He like cannot believe that this seven-year-old is getting bigger laughs than him to the point where he wants to quit the show. And he hates everybody. First, he talks shit about Dave Coulier. I joined the boys and Dave waxes on a bit too seriously about comedy and specifically his comedy and how it sets him apart from other comedians, which is like cringe. But John Stamos spends two whole chapters talking about what a genius Don Rickles is and how his racism is actually really good. poignant <laughs> and helpful. He's like the good kind of racist. Call me nuts, but don't you have to be funny to call yourself a comedian? I don't feel the connection or the funny. It sounds like some kind of Amway sales pitch. So he calls the executive producer and is like, I don't want it to be Dave Coulier. And then later he goes on about how he like doesn't like Bob Saget. Yeah. So then he's like trying to be funny, but Mary Kate and Ashley cry too much. And he's like, they are conspiring against me. I swear to fucking God, these babies don't want me to get a laugh. He also realizes I'm the name on the show and there's a lot riding on my shoulders. With every big laugh Stephanie gets, I slip lower in my seat until I'm practically under the table. The rest is a blur to me. He decides he's like, you know what? This pilot is going to flop. So I'll just shoot the pilot and then I can be done with this whole thing. So they're doing the pilot and Mary Kate and Ashley like won't let him get his funny lines out. Every time it's his line, the babies cry. And every time it's someone else's line, they're quiet. And he's like, the babies are against me. So he gets the babies fired. He gets Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen fired off a full house. And the producer brings in a new set of babies to play Michelle Tanner. And they are ugly. They are quiet, calm and homely as hell. I know I'm one to talk. 
I can't help but wonder if Jeff deliberately chose the homely twins, fully aware that I wouldn't like them and I would beg to get Mary Kate and Ashley back. The way that he uses homely twice in that paragraph, I wonder if like him and his editor sat down and on a blackboard were like, let's write every synonym for ugly that we can come up with and see which one you're allowed to call a baby. <laughs> How ugly could these babies have been if he is like the only defining characteristic I can think of is ugly. So listen, they're going through this whole episode. He's so miserable because Stephanie Tanner is so much funnier than him. He's getting beaten by children. And at the end of the episode, there's clothes everywhere. Danny comes home. He goes, well, what happened was with all the dirty baby clothes. Dave's character, Joey, says, I'm sorry, Danny, but every time we tried changing her, she'd dribble or drool or spit up. My character is less apologetic. Your baby's a pig. The audience explodes. And with that line, everything changes. The pilot ends up testing through the roof. And your baby's a pig is the highest testing moment in the whole show. You want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Be like, oh, he's being self-deprecating by being threatened by a seven-year-old. He's like being silly that he's like looking back. And isn't it funny that he couldn't believe he wasn't the star over Stephanie Tanner. But that line where he's like, and by the way, at the end of the day, I actually was the funniest one. I saved the pilot. It was me. Anyway, up against two comedians and three babies, he's the best. He's the funniest one on the show. He's the most handsome one on the show. He's the coolest one on the show. So if, interestingly enough, Bob Saget was in the pilot because he was busy filming something else. And then luckily he got fired just in time for them to pick it up for the season. And they replaced the main guy with Bob Saget. And Bob Saget and John Stamos did not get along because John Stamos was so funny and good on the show. And Bob Saget, who was the comedian, wasn't getting laughs in the same way. And he was like always really upset with the writers that they weren't writing Danny Tanner funnier. They were like, why is he so sweet? I want him to be funny. I want to come back to that. But I just want to say, so the show did not do well at first. It got really panned. They weren't even sure if they were going to pick up the back 12 episodes or whatever it is. And then they have like one scene left to win over the executives and they show a scene between Jesse and Dave Coulier and Michelle. And they go, that's the show. At its root is about parenting. Guys that don't know how to parent, learning how to be parents and all the single guy stuff and the kids with each other. All the single guy stuff and the kids with each other it can be B and C stories. But what drives the show is parenting stories. We've got those amazing kids. We've got lovable guys. That's the formula. What did they think this show was going to be when but they can started I say, it? Also, he makes such a big thing in talking about Full House to be like, the real crux of the show was not the children and it was not Danny. It was me and Michelle. It was how funny I was. It was how funny I was with Dave. It was how funny I was with the Olsen twins. It was how funny I was with the animals. And like literally he keeps being like, they thought the show was going to be about the kids, but actually it was about me and how funny I was. Yeah. He says it like four or five times. And then he talks about getting the Beach Boys on Full House. I just found this part personally offensive. I remember the Beach Boys being on Full House and I remember really loving that moment. But he genuinely is like, one thing I have been able to do as Uncle Jesse is introduce a new generation of people to the Beach Boys. They would not know about the Beach Boys if it wasn't for me, a guy on Full House. And I remember the Beach Boys being on Full House. I don't remember John Stamos being in the Beach Boys. Throughout this entire book, he talks about how often he toured with them, how often he played with them, how they like officiated his wedding. He loves the Beach Boys and he thinks he is a member of the Beach Boys. I really thought that their collaboration started and ended with one episode of Full House. He EP'd like a docuseries about them that I think they were all pretty unhappy with. <laughs> it's so funny. Probably because it was all about how they wouldn't exist if it wasn't for John Stamos. He did not like Bob when they started. And it was because, as Ashley already said, he was so much funnier and he worked so much harder and Bob was so undermining and would only come out and be inappropriate. Bob is the humblest egomaniac I ever met, but he undercuts his narcissism by being so damn lovable. A walking contradiction, he makes up for his self-inflicted insecurity by being a self-inflicted aggrandizer. Oh, this is actually, can I say one interesting thing about TV mm -hmm. that he said almost by accident, but I found it interesting. So that first season, Full House does not do well. This is back in the day when everything was about a time slot pre-streaming. And so it was slotted at 9 p.m. on Fridays right after some show about a rich man who marries his housekeeper. Can you believe that that bombed? How could you not find the humor in that? <laughs> Anyway, over the summer, they do reruns and they slot it after Who's the Boss, which was at the time the highest rated show. And that bought them a new audience that followed them into season two. And he's like, ugh, Tony Danza. Remember the last time I ran into that guy in my girlfriend's bed? Anyway, then he goes on. Nothing makes me happier than meeting somebody who says I turned them on to the Beach Boys. Cool. I play hundreds of shows in the 1980s and into the 1990s with Mike, Carl, Al, Bruce, and on occasion, Brian Wilson. Then he goes into his friendship with Don Rickles. He thinks he also invented Don Rickles. Yeah. 
anyone who's ever come into contact with John Stamos like did not exist before they date. Oh my god! Him. He also says that about Rebecca Romaine. Yeah, he's like, I brought the Beach Boys to a new generation. He says he brought Don Rickles' name back into the public and got him all of his success. And the only reason anybody likes him now is because of John Stamos. Yeah, we have to save Rebecca Romaine for its own topic. But that really is. I like just didn't even realize how true it is until you just said it. That John Stamos is one of those guys who can make anybody's career but his own. <laughs> And his career is fine. No, I mean, he's a great career. I should be so lucky, but... No, it's pathetic. He's like somebody who's never had a bad thing happen to him. There's just like this weird thing where he's like, and then I wanted to be an actor, so I got on General Hospital. And then I wanted to leave General Hospital, even though I was making so much money, so I went on Full House. And then it all worked out. Yeah. Okay. He like really goes on about how funny it is that Don Rickles says like a lot of really racy jokes. Comedian Don Rickles opens the show with blistering act. He's the ultimate equal opportunity insulter. Equal opportunity insulter. He goes places very few entertainers dare. Just your drunk uncle at Thanksgiving. and Just every white man in a gas station. <laughs> Only the brave heroes of America. He even goes after Sinatra. Make yourself comfortable. Frank hits somebody. There's no race, creed, religion, gender, national origin, or socioeconomic group that he won't skewer. He's laying out everyone in the audience. First, he singles out an Asian woman. Then he singles out a black man and a Mexican man and makes like very racist jokes to each of them. And in his book, he's quoting all the jokes. When his act is over and the lights come on for intermission, I look around the very white Republican Orange County crowd. And he goes, oh my God, this is a room full of white people. There is no Asian woman and no black or Hispanic men. He was just pointing into the dark and doing his act. I realize he's a master of social wizardry. <laughs> At the root of mocking things we're not supposed to make fun of, he's diffusing them. Deflated by humor, the powers of slurs and stereotypes is diminished. Can you imagine walking into an all-white room in Orange County and being like, I've solved racism by making racist jokes to white people? What are you fucking talking about, John Stamos? You sound like an idiot deflated by humor. I mean, it is doing the opposite of deflating. I can't imagine making fun of people of color in an all white Republican room in Orange County is like undermining the racism. It seems like they were just laughing at racist jokes for people who weren't even there. It's literally the opposite of deflating. It's like inciting racism. And then he goes on later in the book to be like, it's a shame you can't say racist shit anymore. People just don't get it when you're as funny as Don Rickles. Yeah, they like cut this really racist thing he says about Obama off of the Jimmy Kimmel thing. And he's like, no, the joke is that he's being racist. Don't you get it? And it's like, no. <laughs> is he saying the Don Rickles character is like making fun of the character of somebody who's racist? It doesn't seem like that's it. I literally don't know what he means by it, but he's like really mad. And then he's like, I was so close to Don that his own kids got jealous, which I understand. They should have been. I'm like, you are just everybody's favorite. He like goes on to spend pages and pages two whole chapters explaining the art of don rickles and how he was a master of comedy and john stamos was like so lucky to now be a master of comedy because he spent time with don rickles also that like he invented him he's like i had this idea to do a documentary about what a brilliant guy he was and then his own son beat me to it but then he kind of takes credit for it too he's like and it gets his name out there he also says this which i find so odd he lights up talking about his wife and their great love story. Their union isn't glamorous like other showbiz marriages, but there is a deep, adoring love that I've rarely seen in a couple. If you ask either of them how they're doing, they always say, we're fine, as if they're one. That sticks with me. I want a connection that's strong. And then like they've been together for literally like 50, 60 years. What isn't glamorous about that? I wonder what he's like looking at other showbiz couples and being like, well, sure, they don't have in dying love and sure they only made it four years, but look at that pool. Now that's a glamorous relationship. That's glam. Look at how the Kardashians are always getting glam. That's glam. That's a glamorous relationship. So then he gets into how he was starting to get a bit restless on Full House. He didn't like his image as like a family guy. He wanted to be able to show what an edgy, serious actor he was. So he starts seeking out roles where he can be really edgy. And in one movie, he plays a wannabe Native American who kidnaps a family and forces himself on the mother. What's a wannabe Native American? I literally don't know. Does that mean he played a Native American? I've just never heard of like a kid being like, I want to be one of those Native Americans. I don't, I actually don't know what happened here. <laughs> then he plays an abusive sociopath who leads a double life. He's like, if I want to be a serious actor, I have to do sexual assault. <laughs> So then he finally realizes, actually, I need a girlfriend on TV. So they hire Lori Laughlin. And of course, he remembers that back in the day, a single long lost date at Disneyland where we made out at the Haunted Mansion. She can't remember the moment. Guess it wasn't as great for her as it was for me. He is obsessed with being like every woman in Hollywood. If you've hooked up with me, you can deny it into the grave, but I will put it in my book. 
<laughs> Why did he do that to her? I don't know. He gets even meaner to her later. But then he gets into what a great woman she is and how they're still friends. And he's never been more sure of her incredible character than the way she handled herself. When she was gone in trouble for like paying her daughter into college. Okay. So she keeps being like, Lori, do you see what they're saying about you? And Lori's like, no. <laughs> and he's like, hey, Lori, it's on the news. He's acting like he was the first person to tell Lori Laughlin that she was in trouble. He goes, Lori, they're talking about you right now on every single channel. And she's like, huh, really? And then she's like, oh yeah, well, I gotta go. I think they're bugging my phone. I'm like, yeah, John, you weren't the one that broke it to her. She knew. The FBI like captured her. <laughs> and this story just like does not make her look good. It makes him look like he never knows what's happening. And the amount of effort that you put into trying to make Lori look like a good person in this story is so insane. She would have been so much better off if you hadn't brought her up at all. I've witnessed moments where giving up could have been the easiest way out for Lori. She could have shifted the blame and let her family, marriage, and life crumble, but she didn't. Who would she have shifted the blame onto? The children that she lied for? Like, who would she have blamed? That little YouTuber? What's her name? Olivia Jade? What if she had just been like, wasn't me, send my daughter to jail? <laughs> but she had so much character. She said, I created this situation, so I guess I am literally to blame for it. I'm not sure I could have taken the hit she did with the resilience she showed. No matter how hard she was hit, how desperate everyone was to cancel her and throw her in with a pile of brutal criminals, she stood fast, protecting her daughters from the mud hurled at them. I don't think anybody called her a brutal criminal. I do think they were like, they're cheating the system. I think that people said they literally did do crime, though. Like, not a brutal criminal. She's not like a dangerous person. But I think people were mad at her for like actually doing a crime, which she did and was convicted of. Regardless of how dire the situation became, Lori's resolve and faith only strengthened. And I think they all ended up on Dancing with the Stars. So, yeah, I guess a jail in its own right, <laughs> a prison system of its own making. But so then we're back on the set of Full House. Lori lachlan has been casted because he's like, oh, in order to prove that I'm a serious actor, I actually just have to show my character falling in love. So she gets cast as Uncle Jesse's love interest. And he's talking about how much fun they had on set, how like the whole cast got along. They were all like a real family. And he's like, yeah, Mary Kate and Ashley were like my kids. Their little sister Lizzie would always come around. And he goes, one day in the future, the two of us would both have places in the Marvel Universe. Her as Scarlet Witch being a little more prominent than the Iron Man voice I do on Disney+. Plus. What do you mean? He also says she becomes his favorite Olsen. What a weird thing to say to be like, my favorite Olsen. We're actually contemporaries now. I do a cartoon voice and she is a Marvel superhero. The way that he says things is so insane. Especially because she's also like a acclaimed actual actor. Do you know what I mean? To be like, you might know her because she's in the Marvel Universe. Like you can just give someone a compliment that doesn't tie back to you. You're allowed. I agree. Then what he does on the next page is so insane. So like the way he paces things. And I know Ashley keeps talking about about how he'll be like, hinting at a story. And then the story has nothing to do with what led us here. It just is another way to prove how famous he was. So here's another like insane selection of paragraphs. So him, Bob and Dave, I feel like we're actually quite contentious on set. Like it seems like they had like a brotherly love and that they fought a lot and were very jealous of one another. Bob does America's Funnest Home Videos. Dave does like a knockoff of that. Then the thing that bonds them is that all three of their sisters get life-threatening diseases at the same time. Bob's sister, Gay, is diagnosed with scleroderma. Dave Coulier's sister, Sharon, is diagnosed with cervical, ovarian, and uterine cancer. And then John's sister, Janine, has a tumor in her brain. The only thing is it turns out it's not a tumor. And so she lives and the other two sisters die. And it bonds them all because they're all going through hell. And then he just goes, Bob is the earliest adopter of tech and gets a Mac. We all receive free subscriptions to AOL. Like, he just moves on. Like, okay, how is that? There's not even a line break. There's not even a conclusion of that. He's just like, everyone's sister dies. And we get AIM. <laughs> it was a crazy year for the full house. <laughs> Also, Dave dates Alanis Morissette. And they just think she's like some rando musician. And then Jagged Little Pill comes out. And Dave is like, oh, my God, I think this is about me. <laughs> <laughs> is this fucking play about us? And it was. Yeah, he's like, Alanis asked me for advice of people she can meet in the music industry. I wished her luck. And I'm like, she didn't use your fucking luck. So then he talks about how good Full House is. Eventually, it touches everyone's heart. The little kids that were supposed to be background noise, no more important than the furniture, grow up to become the kind of humans I hope to have one day. I have to break something to you, John. I don't think they were ever supposed to be furniture. It is insane that you're obsessed with being like, and I was supposed to be the star. And these kids were supposed to be my fucking sidekick bitches that I could have <laughs> kicked if I wanted to, like they were dustbins. But luckily, I saw that they had some talent and I gave them the right to be funny. But I still was the star, just like I was promised. And the furniture came to life, just like Belle and the Beast. We haven't even told you that he's obsessed with Disney. When I read his wedding vows to you guys, if you're in a car, you have to pull over. I'll give you a trigger warning. 
Oh, he ends this chapter. You want to hear something spooky? Yeah. Bob Saget would joke, we did full house, fuller house. Next will be fullest house where I'll be in a nice urn above the fireplace. Oof. Of course, there could never be any version of the show without Bob. So now the real fucking Thorne and Lori Loughlin side. I mean, I don't know how to even say this. He's so mean to Lori Loughlin. He talks about how there was one point in his life where he and Lori Loughlin were both single. And so, like, there was kind of this will they or won't they situation where they might have dated. And he even says she's one of the only girls I can hang out with every day and I still want to see her the next day. So he brings Lori Loughlin to a party. A Victoria's Secret party. And leaves with Rebecca Romaine's number. Lori or Rebecca, Rebecca or Lori, am I going to sit in a swing forlorn at the drive-in wearing a motorcycle jacket warbling like John Travolta for Sandra D? Or am I putting on the Leatherman sweater to enter the carnival in search of the black patent leather stilettos with the chills multiplying? Basically, he's like, Lori Loughlin is nice and Rebecca Romaine is hot. So I went with hot. Lori has my number the whole time. As each leggy beauty walks down the runway, she shoots me a knowing look and maintains a little smirk. And then they date for a little bit and they get married. It's funny because he's like, she knows I'm not ready to settle down. But then he does immediately settle down with the next girl he marries. Yeah. And then on their honeymoon, she's also shooting Sports Illustrated. And at the dinner, he like is really talking her up. And so when she gets the cover of Sports Illustrated, he's like, I'm not saying it was me, but could she have done it without me? Literally, yes. She's so hot, you fucking idiot. And then he pours all of his energy into making her have a film career, which by that I mean, I think that he just like told her that she should audition for more movies. And then he like takes credit for everything. So first he takes credit for that Sports Illustrated cover because he claims he was like back there saying that you guys should pick her and that they liked that she had a famous husband. Yeah. But then he also talks it up and he's like, I told them that she's like really good on talk shows. And then she auditions for this MTV House of Style, which Cindy Crawford had been the host of. And she auditions and doesn't get it. So then he's like, well, let's try again. I'll talk you up. And they like help her figure out a new audition tape and she sends it in and gets it. He asked his friends to get her another job on a some indie thing. Behind every good man is a good woman. And maybe behind every it girl, there's a not it husband pulling a few strings. I tell myself that I've had a good run. Now it's her turn. Then she's in The Spy That Shagged Me. And then she's in X-Men, which is huge. She goes from a high-end catalog model to the big screen effortlessly. And I'm proud of her. To call a like, Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover model a high-end catalog model is so tinged. With violence. To say that everything she got was basically him. Okay, well, what about Mystique on X-Men? That was kind of the big one. What did you have to do with that? Yeah. The idea that she was only successful because of him is insane. And then he goes on to be like, and I wasn't successful because of her. Well, he literally says that he was like pouring all of his energy into her. So she didn't even really think about his own career for years. And then he meets with Ryan Murphy and Ryan Murphy offers him nip tuck. And Rebecca is like, that's like, kind of a fucked up script to women. It's demeaning to women, she says dismissively. I think there's more to the show, but we talk it out and I turn down Nip Tuck. Little by little, I start to second guess my instincts, short sell my abilities, take fewer risks and get lost in my marriage. I do, however, put energy into the parties we're hosting on most weekends. She bounces back faster than I do. That's not her fault. That's not her fault that she's just beautiful and radiant and can drink. I don't actually know who this is, Jack Klugman. Maybe John, biologically. He tells John Stamos that he should be in theater. And John Stamos is like, what? Me? What are you talking about? And then he gets an opportunity to do a Broadway show. And he's like, yeah, actually, that's like what Jack told me to do. He said, get to the theater. So I'm going to get to the theater. So he does how to succeed in business without really trying. I guess that's like the story of his life. So I don't know how it didn't come very naturally to him. Right. And people say he does really well. Then he sees Cabaret for the first time. And he didn't really know that much about the play. And he's like, yeah, one of my friends had like tried to explain the Holocaust to me and it was too sad. So I was like, don't tell me about that. He says he tried to educate me about the era over the years, but it was too dark. I didn't understand war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Sing it again. (laughs) (laughs) I do think if you think there shouldn't be war, you definitely should be studying then. I don't think like ignoring the situation is how war goes away. I believe, actually, famously, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. And so, you know, he's like, I had never even really thought much about World War II. It never really occurred to me until I saw Cabaret and I thought, oh, my God, I love Nazis. (laughs) Okay, so then he's like, I decided to do Alan Cummings' role in Cabaret. He takes over for Alan Cumming. The role of MC. Can I say, I really want us to interview Alan Cumming. Okay. We're putting that out there. Alan, 
Are you listening? Paging Allen. Anyway, so he says I'm going to do it in honor of my first ever press guy. He was a giant Greek gay guy who wasn't understood. And he talks about like the first time he has a conversation about why he's gay. He goes, I don't really get it, Greg. What do you see in guys? And Greg goes, what do you see in girls? You know that feeling when you see a girl you're attracted to, that warm, tingly feeling? Well, that's how I feel when I see a guy I'm attracted to. Okay, I stop and really take in this analogy. After a long beat, I get it. How could that... (laughs) Is that even an analogy? If someone said to me, Claire, how could you love carrots? And I said, you know how you love candy? Well, that's how it feels to me when I eat carrots. Is that an analogy? I don't know. I don't understand. Like, there are so many times in this book where he's like, I'd never even heard of anything that wasn't my exact direct worldview. But when I found (laughs) out there was something else, I thought, oh, love is love. (laughs) It's just so funny to be like, I can't understand being gay. What could anybody see in a man? Anyway, women are coming up off the street fucking me silly against my will. (laughs) What do those bitches see? Honestly, what is there to see in a man? You got me there. Anyway, so he's in cabaret. People think he's really good. They walked out not because I was bad, but because I was good. Too good. Word on the street is I'm a must-see MC, and people would not only not walk out, but come back again and again. Not only is he good, he is one of the highest ticket-selling MCs since like the opening run of cabaret, which was that Joel Gray? I don't know. The Olsen twins come see him in cabaret. He's like, it's so crazy. I'm so good at it. However, during cabaret, he gets into the habit of drinking an entire bottle of wine every show, even the shows where he's doing two shows a day. And he's like, I can say farewell to cabaret, but can't cut loose the cabernet. I don't know if he has a drinking problem or not, to be honest. He doesn't know either, I don't think. It's brought up as the beginning of this book of like, I'm so drunk, I'm out of control. And then I'm like, were you out of control? Were you just like a rich party boy? It's tough to tell. You know when you're like, are they an alcoholic? Are they in college? He has that disease. Yeah, but he like stays in college until he's like 51. Things are like not good with him and Rebecca. But then he gets another play and he's going to be replacing Antonio Banderas in a play called Nine. And Antonio Banderas is so good at it, even though he's like Antonio Banderas is not good at it because he went to see one of the first previews. And then it turns out that after the previews, he like got better. So he goes back to say how nervous he is about following Antonio. And Antonio's like, you'll be fine. If you do need anything, I'm here for you, which is nice. And then he's like, and then he started talking to other people as if that's rude. Antonio has shit to do. I can hear Antonio screaming on the phone at somebody. The stage manager looks both ways and confesses, probably talking to his wife, Melanie. They fight like cats and dogs. She's playing Roxy in Chicago across the street and getting love letters for reviews. Drives him crazy and she knows it. Then he gets back at her by telling her all the girls in the cast are flirting with him. They go on and on. And sometimes we can't get him out of his dressing room. He'll hide under the desk. Why are you airing out Antonio Banderas' business like Because this? he was good at a role that you were then cast in? Like, this isn't an affront on you that he was good at his job. John Stamos, mind your goddamn business. So then John Stamos takes over this role and isn't that good at it. And the play closes. And so he's like in a really bad place in his career. Plus, his relationship with Rebecca is not that good. And he goes, as I'm lifting Rebecca up, I'm losing myself. Shut up. I can't believe the way he blames her like that. Rebecca doesn't notice me slipping away and I don't notice myself adrift. He like doesn't even know what he wants out of marriage. They separate for a little bit and then they get back together. But she has a list of demands. I wish with all my heart he would have shared the list of demands. She's now the one in charge. And I feel like I've forgotten what I wanted out of this marriage just to be happy. Oh, poor John Stamos. So he's like, she has all these new friends and they're name droppy and they think she's a star and they think I'm not good enough. They think I'm not smart. You're not that smart. And they finally break up and they're going to have a very easygoing divorce. And it's like weird because I guess he had more money going in, but she's made a lot of money since. I can't imagine she didn't make a good amount of money on X-Men. They're like, it's actually going to be pretty even. But because John had more money at the beginning and Rebecca has more money now, she actually owes him in some of the taxes that he like paid on her behalf. And so... They're like, okay, well, what if she gives you half the taxes she owes you? And he goes, half the taxes? After what she did to me? She stole my life. And then he goes, I'm telling the press that I filed for divorce against you. And she's like, that's fine. I want to yell that she owes me the last 10 years of my life, my dreams, my goals, my plans for a fairy tale future. I never knew I could be so angry and hate-filled toward another human being, much less one that I've been dedicated to for a decade. I knew. I actually knew that you had that in you. But I also will say, tell me the list of demands, John, for him to be like slamming his fists on the table and being like, you stole my youth, you heartless wench. He does say eventually he realizes that he actually wasn't completely blameless in the dissolution of his marriage. 
but I am like, what were her complaints with you? I have to know. You had a list. Yeah. He puts a lot of handwritten notes in this book from his parents. Where's the list? Drinking helps me feel like I'm right. Let's have a toast to me. I wasn't a perfect husband, but I'm a good guy. One more round. Look at me. She was lucky to have me. I made her career. I'll be back, baby. And when I am, I'll forget your name, pop the cork, pour out the wine, sit in that self-righteousness. And then he's like, I'm busted up beyond repair, a failure to those I love, a failure to myself. It's a public divorce that knocks the wind out of me, dents my pride. Still, there's something in me that knows if I ever intend to get married again, I'll have to do a lot of work on myself. And then he goes, but instead of getting to work, I'm getting loaded, getting in my car and getting a DUI that sends me to rehab. And I was like, is this a different time? But no, it seems like he went to rehab and that got that DOI one time in 2015. Their divorce was filed August 2004, finalized the next year. And in 2015, he's like, the DOI was because of the heartbreak. That's crazy. I'm sorry. King of deflection. No matter how much you love another person, don't forget to love yourself. No matter how much you want another person to succeed, don't sell yourself out. For women, it's about keeping your independence and empowerment in any relationship. For men, I don't know, compromise wherever you can, but don't negotiate every aspect of life. Keep your balls. Oh my God. In what way do you feel you were de-bold, John? Sorry that you're not a good actor and you couldn't get another role. It's not like she was saying you're not allowed to audition for things. You were on Broadway living across the country from her. She did not derail your life. I'm sorry that you couldn't stand up and say, I think Nip Tuck is good. I'm sorry you didn't get another script, but how is it her fault? You were still auditioning. She didn't want to have kids because she wanted to keep focusing on her career. It seems like you were allowed to do whatever you wanted for your career. It's not her fault that you weren't talented. So he and Bob become really good friends because they're both single now. And like they've always been buddies, but now they are like partners in crime out on the town hitting on babes. They have these big parties that like the whole cast of Full House comes to still, which is like weird, I think. In the morning, Bob sneaks one of the Olsen twins down to the beach and into a waiting car to avoid the paparazzi. I just feel like everybody's obsessed with being like, one time we partied with the Alton twins after they got famous. <laughs> All the full house people are like, and then one time they did show up to a party we threw. Could you believe that? Uh, he also is like, I made a really funny joke that Bob loved. It was that his breath smelled so bad. It smelled like a shit took a shit in his mouth. <laughs> I'm like, great joke, John. One for the books, as they would say. Okay, this is the craziest line in the whole book. So he is trying to get another role. George Clooney has left ER because he's going to become a movie star. And he's like, oh, my God, you did like a couple seasons on a primetime show. And you think you could become a movie star? Okay. And then they want John Stamos to maybe replace him. And then he's like, wait, I have to audition to replace George Clooney. And he goes, I thought this was my role, the role that would catapult me to a Clooney level career. We both started out in goofy sitcoms. We're both funny and self-deprecating. Hell, I was doing this first. I practically paved the way for guys like him. And now I have to audition to replace him. I like can't tell if he's kidding. And then the punchline is he doesn't get the role. And then years later, he gets a role on ER without having to audition at all. And they're like, the reason we didn't use you is because you were too much like George Clooney. And we wanted you to have your own path. And we didn't want to set you up for failure by comparing the two of you. I'm not the Clooney type. I'm the John Stamos of the group. Totes. Oh, my God. And then there's a whole chapter about a wedding he goes to at... At Burning Man. And how that changed his life. Yeah, because at Burning Man, no one really knew that he was John Stamos and no one cared. On the playa, we're all equal. <laughs> no, well, what happens is he says nobody recognized him and he had no game, so he got no girls. And he was like, oh, this sucks. Yeah. On the playa, I'm actually a loser. <laughs> anyway, so then he goes down to Australia and he gets so drunk constantly he can't stop drinking and he like acts like a doofus on an interview and then he has this plan on the next interview to be like i'm not drunk that guy had a small dick and he gets really drunk before that interview and would you believe it doesn't go over well yeah and then his publicist has to tell everyone he was on ambient and he's like why did they say i was on ambient i was just gonna say i was drunk (laughs) then he plays opposite james earl jones again james earl jones has one great thing in his life and it's that he helped john stamos become a better actor Yeah, thank God that James Earl Jones was around for John Stamos. What else has that guy done? And he got into theater because of his good friends, Matt Stone and Trey Parker. You may know them as the writers of South Park. They like him, which means he's very funny because they're geniuses and they think he's funny. And actually, interesting fact, the first ever celebrity that gets name dropped and made fun of on South Park is John Stamos. And he says, why me? And they say, because early on in our career, we were at an agency and we watched you storm by and the secretary says, you can't just go back there without an appointment. And you said, watch me. And we thought that was so douchey. And he's like, isn't that funny? And then they put me in their show. And I'm like, John. That's not funny to me. That's not a good story. And why are they your friends now? He talks about why he's normally avoided political roles in the past because he doesn't want to talk about 
religion or politics because he doesn't think it's like really good for celebrities to like mention religions or politics because it's effectively force feeding their audiences your religion and your politics he also says i don't want to alienate any fans and i'm like that i believe i that i I do believe that there's no cause to you that you hold more dear than money and fame totally and then his dad dies and he's very sad about it. His dad did die like very young, 65. Yeah, of a heart attack. Which is sad. He was very, very close to his family and I give him credit for that. And then his mom dies soon after and he's like, we all knew because like they were so in love and had always been together. Yeah. So then he gets this role on Law & Order that he doesn't want to take, but his agent is like, no, you should do this Law & Order gig. They are obsessed with it, getting him typecast as a rapist. I know. They're like, if you want to win an Emmy, you have to assault somebody. They're like, didn't you say you wanted to be cast as a bad boy? We found a role for you on Law & Order where you're poking holes into condoms. It's perfect. Yeah. I really feel like nobody knows what a bad boy is. So he meets this girl named Caitlin on the episode and he like immediately is obsessed with her. And she's like, oh, yeah, my fiance, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, fiance, what the fuck? She is 24 at this point and he's 47. Yes. So they start texting. They have like a texting relationship. And then she's like, my fiance doesn't want me to text you anymore because he feels kind of weirded out by it. And he's like, oh, my God, that is so controlling. Although he has a point and that's because I want to date you. Well, I wonder if this is the controlling thing or if in other ways he was controlling as well. I wonder. But then he literally says, okay, no, to be fair, he had a point, which is that I wanted to date you. So then five and a half years later, he's on Fuller House. And guess who's in the studio audience? Her. Her. But with her new boyfriend. But she's like, oh, he's just my boyfriend. And John is like, okay, I'm in. And he's like stalking her on Instagram. And one day she posts a photo, just dog, no boyfriend. He goes, that's it. They broke up. And he goes, can I take you to Disney World? Also, what is this girl like that she literally never posted a single thing without her boyfriend unless she was officially single? Smart. Smart. Effective. Yeah. It seems like she went from husband to boyfriend (laughs) to husband. So she posts a photo of just her and her dog. He slides in the DMs. They start hanging out. Within six months, he's like, you're moving in with me. And then he goes like, when do you want to have kids? And she's like, eventually... She says six months to a year and he's like, okay, well then you should probably already be pregnant if you're going to have a kid in six months. Also on their first date, he takes her to Disneyland. So he thinks like one of their deep connections is that they both love Disneyland, which is such a funny thing to think is unique when it is quite literally one of the largest brands in the world. We don't call it a Disney adult because it's only one Disney adult. (laughs) It describes a group. And so on their first date, they go to Epcot and he like takes off his glasses and hat so that everyone can see that he's there and he can sign autographs and show off how famous he is. And he's like, she thought that was really tacky. And now whenever I try to make people realize how famous I am, she calls it Epcotting. And she's like, stop Epcotting. And he's like, that's what I liked about her. I liked that she was disgusted by my need for fame. And I was like, it is gross. They struggle to have a baby. It takes about a year, but they finally get pregnant via IUI. Then he proposes at Disneyland. And then she's like, what if we actually get married in like two weeks? And he's like, well, there's a dream wedding that we've talked about. So if you can make that dream wedding happen in two weeks, we'll get married in two weeks. And they do. The only problem is the night before she gets robbed and somebody steals like hundreds of thousands of dollars of stuff. Okay, are you guys ready for the vows? It was officiated by a beach boy and the music was by a beach boy. Okay. Caitlin, I proposed to you at Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, because I knew that marrying you would make me the happiest man on earth. You are every Disney princess wrapped into one woman. You have Snow White's gentle compassion for others, Cinderella's strength to overcome hard times and emerge as the belle of the ball, Ariel's wit and feistiness, Princess Jasmine's flashing dark eyes, the gorgeous tumbling hair of Rapunzel, the adventurous spirit of Pocahontas, and Belle's ability to see the beauty in this beast. If I could ask one wish of a fairy godmother, it would be to have my own mother and father here with us today. Not just because I miss them with all my heart, but because I would love to see the smiles on their faces knowing I'd pick the best mother for their grandchild. Our fairy tale is just beginning. That is a humiliating thing to say to a grown woman on her wedding day. In front of your loved ones. So then he becomes a father and upon holding his newborn, he goes, I think I get why there are so many fucked up people in this world. (laughs) (laughs) Parenting is hard. And then he's upset because he feels like the baby's closer to his wife than to him. Can I say this part like annoyed the shit out of me, but I actually found it to be a bit honest and vulnerable. I did think it was probably helpful because I have heard this a lot. Like the baby is born and obviously you're not as bonded as the mother just from a biological perspective. Yeah. And so I think like him waiting and being patient, just like helping the mom and the baby and then waiting for his connection to form. I think that that is something that like maybe men need to hear more than I give them credit for. 
but because he's such a whiny attention whore throughout this whole book, it like doesn't have the same gravitas. There's something about a six year old man being like, my wife made me a baby, but it's only likes her. <laughs> I want a baby that likes me. This baby's broken. <laughs> and then Bob Saget's like, wait till it laughs at one of your jokes. That's a high like you'll never know. And I'm like, that is so fucking comedy sick. Bob Saget was comedy pilled and I get it. He like talks like that's everybody's experience. Like no man's ever loved a baby until the baby laughed at one of his jokes. And I'm like, I think there might be other things. There is a weird bombshell at the end of this book. He's going to this event for like abused children. And he has this moment where he's like, oh yeah. He's like, oh my God. I just remembered that I was sexually assaulted when I was a kid by my babysitter. And then he never gets back into it again. And he's like, I didn't feel like it was appropriate to talk about it this night. But and then he goes up and he accepts the award. And he never returns to it. This book is so scattered. There are so many pieces. I guess we keep on talking about how he's just like a guy with no story to tell. And I do think, not even rewritten, I think if you like rearranged the words and the stories in this book, it could have had a narrative arc. It just doesn't. And so then you don't even know what to do with these stories when they're not like handled with any emotional truth. And I think that pulls into what I was saying earlier about the way he talked about vanity. There is a theme in his life that like older women are like assaulting him and like he's like this hot person who's getting used and I think there is something to be said there. But then he's also adamant about being like, I was never abused in this industry. My mom looked out for me. Yeah. But he doesn't give it any weight so it's hard. Like when you're reading, you could miss it. Yeah. Which is a weird thing to say about someone's like childhood sexual abuse. (laughs) Yeah. So then Bob Saget passes away and I will say this is fucked up. Okay, so he first finds out because his publicist is getting a call from TMZ And then Candace Cameron calls him and is like, hey, I think Bob Saget might have died because some girl from Florida is DMing me that her sister is a cop who like has the police report. The way people think it's their fucking business to talk about the death of a celebrity before his like friends and family even know is really fucking sick. Mm -hmm. I agree. But this time he's not going to let it spiral out of control like last time because he has a wife and a baby and he has to stay healthy for them. I'm holding it together on the surface, but feeling broken, shattered, and worthless to help others. Caitlin sees me faltering, throws me in the car, and drives me to Bob's and Kelly's house. I will say they have a moment of levity when they're all there, like mourning Bob Saget. Candace Cameron's phone starts ringing, and her ringtone is, it's a heartbreak warfare. Yeah. And they run to get it because John Mayer is in the room with them, and that is so embarrassed. I would be humiliated. Anyway, then we hit the epilogue. I will say there's one quote that I missed where he's talking about his wife and he's like, I always thought that I needed a woman who was like better than me to make my life more exciting and be a power couple. Yeah, but it turns out I can actually have a regular wife. And I'm like, that is a weird thing to say about your wife. He does call her beautiful and funny and smart a lot. Yeah. He does seem obsessed with her. And I'm like, as you should be, she's 30 years younger than you and actually so gorgeous. She's so pretty. I will say he's not wrong. She's very beautiful. I guess John Stamos is like very aware of his fucking delayed adolescence. There's something about him where I'm like, I don't know, maybe there will be another chapter in your life where you like learn that other people have thoughts and stories too. He's the kind of man who's lived a life where I'm like, the prize is the life. You can't now ask for adoration. Yes. Like your life has been... It's been good enough. And now you need everybody to know about all the hot girls you fucked. You need everybody to know about all your time with the Beach Boys. You need everybody to know that after 60 years of dicking around and partying with your boys, you decided one day... I'd like to get it together. And the hottest little 30-year-old came up and made you a baby. And now you get to have a normal family life too. And the other thing is like, you also need to be thought of as funny and thoughtful. The intro of this book being like, no, you have to understand he's a good guy. He's not, but that doesn't mean he's the worst guy. I just didn't need this book. And I don't think he should have written it. If you said, what was the purpose of this book? I would love to hear what he had to say. Yeah. Something that was interesting to me about Patrick Stewart is that he's like, I want it to be entertaining. I'm like, what was this book to you, Johnny? I do think it is that he like wants people to congratulate him more for how good he's done with all of the tools he was born with. (laughs) Hey, that's not true. He had to get a nose job. Twice. So he didn't not fight for it. How fertile would you consider this soil? Two out of five. Maybe 1.5 out of five. And how many worm teenies would you want to have with him? Zero. I think I would get one worm teeny because I am curious about... I think he would tell you anything about anybody. Yeah. I think he loves to name drop and spill the tea. Yeah, I agree. I guess I think that one worm teeny is like an opportunity I wouldn't pass up. (laughs) Fair enough. Who would we get all the worm teenies in the world with? Oh, I would get a million worm teenies with our five-star reviewers. 